It was a Thursday morning. Uh, I'd woken up early and my wife and my four month old baby were still asleep. So I thought I'd run over to the store real quick before they woke up. Cop pulls up behind me and flashes his lights. I pull over. They put me in a car. They let me have a phone call. Early that morning, I'd woken up to a text that Russ had been arrested. I was still in bed when I got a text. Everyone was really on edge wondering, you know, what was going on and what was happening. And I had to go and run an errand. And I went and I got in my car and I was just a few blocks from my apartment. I was suddenly surrounded by cop cars. They pulled me over and immediately there were all of these cops at my window telling me I have to get out of the car, you're under arrest, you know, get, show me your hands. It was honestly terrifying. I got out of the car, they cuffed me. I saw a cop take my phone and start looking at it. And he was commenting, oh, Joel's blowing up her phone, Joel's blowing up her phone. I thought that was alarming, you know, that they knew Joel's name. Um, at this point, you know, we're on the phones. We are trying to track down where Lillian is, what happened. Uh, at one point, I actually got in a car and drove around and tried to find Lillian. We found out that Lil had also been arrested. And at that point, I was just preparing myself for the worst as well, you know. And as I was being driven to the jail, we drove past the street that Joel lives on and I looked over and there were all of these cop cars moving towards his apartment building and I got a real bad feeling about that. At this point I'm sitting in my living room when I noticed that there is a police tank otherwise known as a uh, MRAP which is a mine resistant uh, ambush protected vehicle and this is one of the vehicles that they that the military has used on its patrols in places like Iraq and Afghanistan and this was outside of my apartment they sent in a tactical team SWAT team fully automatic weapons tactical gear banged on my door Joel come out you're under arrest I've been trained like since I was a young child that uh, an encounter with the police it increases the risk of death tremendously by a significant amount um, at this point, I'm thinking, you know, I either go with them or they're going to just straight up execute me. Minutes later, um, there were like eight cops at my door. My husband had gone to take out the trash in our apartment and I could hear this commotion coming from outside of my apartment door. And so I looked through the peephole and I could see all these officers had surrounded him. He was back against the door and they were all asking him a lot of questions about me. I opened the door and uh, pulled Dominic inside and then asked to see a warrant. And I had just started jogging around the park. Like six patrol cars surrounded me. Just a bunch of cops hopped out and were like, you're under arrest. And I just put my hands up. Um, when I first got to jail, um, there was this holding area uh, and I saw Lillian there. And I was at this point, I was like, yep, this is, this is confirmed. This is a coordinated execution of warrants against leaders of PSL. You know, I've been sitting there for hours just waiting, uh, and I see Joel come in. It was a weird feeling because, you know, I was kind of relieved to see someone, you know, who I know in it with me. But it also was, you know, terrifying because Joel's wrapped up in this too. When I came into the jail, I immediately saw Lillian. I think I immediately started crying a little just because it was hard to see Eliza wrapped up in this too. And, you know, I was trying to talk to her across the room. Um, but as soon as, you know, we started communicating, they came for me and started pulling me back to get changed into my, my jail clothes. And so as I was being carted out though, me, Eliza and Joel were able to you know, to look each other in the eyes. And we all just kind of looked at each other and put our fists up in solidarity. That moment did stick with me as just like, we're in this together, we're gonna be strong, and they're not gonna get to us, they're not gonna win. Nobody had, nobody showed me a warrant, nobody would tell me what my charges were when I was being arrested in the cop car, they wouldn't tell me what I was being charged with. And I finally, when I was in booking, got the start of an answer from one of the cops. And she was like, you're being charged with kidnapping. And I was like, kidnapping? And she was like, you're a protester, huh? And I was like, yeah, I'm a protester, but you know, none of our protests have involved any kidnapping. Happy Surprise! Birthday. Happy late 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 birthday. Happy late
happy super late birthday. <laughs> Clayton was a massage therapist who taught himself to play the violin and the guitar. He was a vegetarian who loved animals. He also had anemia, so he sometimes wore a ski mask to keep himself warm. Last August, he went to the convenience store to buy iced tea, and on his way home, a man called 911 because Elijah McLean was wearing that ski mask and waving his arms. I have to warn you, the body camera footage from when the police confronted McLean is disturbing. In that confrontation, he told police, quote, I am an introvert, please respect my boundaries that I am speaking, I am just different. Instead, they restrained him on the ground and used a chokehold. When the paramedics arrived, they injected him with a strong sedative. On the way to the hospital, McLean had a heart attack and he died a few days later. I remember the first night that we heard about what happened to Elijah. And actually that was the night when he had been brutalized and beat up by the police. He didn't actually die until a few days later. Um, and I remember reading the news of that and just being horrified that you know this young person was walking home and had just been absolutely horrendously beat by multiple APD officers. And so the night after he died, we went to the vigil. Um, that's when we started getting involved in you know, fighting to make sure that there was accountability um, for these officers who, who killed him. The fact that, you know, Elijah McLean was a, you know, someone who played violin to cats at a shelter and was an innocent person who wouldn't hurt a fly, um, but the police still killed him um, and are still trying to make it seem as if he was a criminal. It tells us uh, as an organization that like, what we already know is that like, it's, it's a criminalization of blackness in and of itself. It's, it's a criminalization of oppressed nations people in and of itself. We are killed because we are criminals. I remember uh, first meeting the PSL organizers and Terrence at one of the really early rallies, way before it was popular to come out in support of Black Lives Matter and, and against police brutality. Uh, PSL and Terrence uh, were there at the forefront with signs ready to stand up and ready to call for justice. And so in those first months, you know, it was really an uphill battle. Almost immediately, the Aurora DA announced that he wasn't gonna file any charges whatsoever. Um, there was a lot of foul play in that taking shape. There was no injuries to him whatsoever. He's no dead. serious. He's dead. Yeah, if you want to say the forensic pathologist doesn't know what he's doing, you could say that all you want. No, but that's, that's what you were saying to get away from my question. You're saying there are no injuries. The guy's dead. So clearly things happened oh. to him that were wrong, Mr. DA. Yeah, he's got a heart. It's got a very narrow valve, an aorta valve, and he probably most likely died from excited delirium. You know, they were doing things like continuing to classify Elijah as a suspect in the case, something that allowed them to one, smear Elijah, but to two, deny the McLean family just basic forms of restitution, like funeral costs. Absolutely nothing has been done by the Aurora officials uh, to achieve justice. Um, in fact, what Aurora has done for the entire time is deny, deny, deny accountability. And so in those first months, we were at city councils. We were holding you know, vigils and demonstrations and press conferences, trying to make sure that as much light was brought onto the situation as possible and you know, trying to engage people around this. But the climate just wasn't what it was this summer where people were really tuned into the brutality of the police. Um, and there were really a handful of people who were continuing to show up. Like, let's say when Ferguson was going on, when Mike Brown was killed, we didn't have big protests in Denver like we had this summer. We didn't have that energy. We, you know, when the riots happened in Los Angeles in, in 92, we didn't have that kind of energy in, in Denver. Denver or Aurora was not the city you could count on to show up f for the movement like that. Not like that, right? We went through the winter holiday and then boom, George Floyd happened. Good evening, everyone. We're coming on the air with the latest on the wave of protests and uh, unrest taking place at this hour across the country. Outrage at the death of George Floyd, an African-American man while in police custody in Minneapolis nearly a week ago. In city after American city tonight, thousands of people have once again taken to the streets to express their anger, frustration and solidarity with others.
We were leading these mass protests in Denver, you know, following the death of George Floyd that were bringing out thousands and thousands of people. And we really felt that we needed to bring that struggle closer to home. You know, we have victims of police brutality that are happening right in our backyards. We started to um, bring Elijah's name up and to let people know that there was a case of police brutality right in this very town, um, that the struggle was ongoing, that the struggle had been going since August of 2019, and there was no justice. Aurora is used to not having things disrupted. This changes today. Aurora will become a site of resistance from here on out. If Elijah don't get justice, if Elijah don't get justice, make some noise. This is liberated I-225. It's more difficult to protest in Aurora because um, the police are much more prone to brutality here. Um, it's always like you hear cautionary tales, see cautionary tales, and everybody that lives here, the immigrant community, the black community, we know that we have to be super careful here just because APD <laughs> is more likely to kill you. The Aurora police are one of the most just brutal, gangsterish, mafia type police forces in this country. Um, they routinely kill, brutalize, harass people um, in Aurora. You know, it's it's gotten to a point where people are realizing that like we don't want to live like this. Elijah McLean's last words are haunting from this person who was clearly not a threat in any way, but who was being treated with this horribly violent force. And that exact dynamic replayed itself in Aurora, Colorado at the site of a protest and a vigil in honor of McLean on Saturday. Hundreds of people came out to uh, pay tribute to Elijah's life by playing the violin. And those peaceful violinists and protesters were met with police officers dressed up like stormtroopers. All of a sudden, we see the Gestapo come and start forming in this area back here. The violins start getting nervous and I run across from the, the bench over here and I tell the violins, keep playing, keep playing, don't stop playing. And then I tell the people in the grass, protect the violinist. And so everybody gets up and makes a shield. <laughs> then there's a little girl that was playing and doing cartwheels and she didn't know what was going on. I literally had to put myself between this little girl who peed on herself um, because she was so scared. I just felt defeated that day because we were doing exactly what we were told to do by the city. You know, we were standing exactly where we were supposed to stand. No charges will be filed at this time for the man who drove into protesters at this Elijah McClain protest in July. That was a weird day from the beginning. I think everybody had kind of a weird vibe. There had been threats from right-wingers. They were seeing the size of these protests. They were seeing that we were challenging, you know, the impunity of the police. You know, we were under the impression that police had stopped all of the traffic and yet this Jeep driver was able to get through and come barreling at full speed at this crowd. This is the moment a white truck crashed into the Jeep. The truck's driver says he wanted to stop the Jeep from continuing on. Once he's struck by that truck, what would a normal person in that situation do? And if someone back there is watching this on Facebook Live saying, well, I would have stopped and tried to figure out why they hit me. 
I wouldn't have. But Aurora Councilwoman Allison Coombs says the driver could have stopped. Because you see videos of him being slowed down, trying to get around those vehicles. And so if he wanted to stay away from those protesters, I think not charging into them would have been the best course of action. That moment itself was uh, very, very frightening. I was at the front of the march. Um, I hear loud crashes. Which was, thank God, the truck who intercepted the Jeep who was coming at full speed towards the crowd. That crash was him slowing him down and then just screams as people ran to the sides of the highway. When I see this Jeep Rubicon just speeding by. Um, at this point, I'm like, oh wow, yeah, this was an attempt at a mass casualty event using a vehicle. A protester fired a weapon in response, grazing at least one person. According to the Denver Post, witnesses say someone else was hurt while dodging that car. Some of the charges that we're facing are for marching on a highway as if that is the crime here um, or a crime at all. And when people come together in large numbers, that is the space that is accessible to them quite frequently. It is a common way of expressing yourself, of marching, of showing people's power. The criminalization of protesting on public ways, on public streets, on highways, is something that we're seeing increasingly happen around the country, also with these anti-protest laws, clearly targeted at the movement for black lives and the racial justice movement. And this is an effort by the legislators and the police to try and stop people from a traditional form of political association and speech. There's a long tradition in the civil rights movement of marching onto roadways as a symbolic expression of the power of the people to say, enough is enough. We are you know, really demonstrating our ability to stop business as usual in the face of oppression, which can't be allowed to stand. Hundreds of people protested outside an Aurora police station demanding more disciplinary action following the death of Elijah McClain. Friday's protest began hours after the police department released a disturbing photo that appears to show three officers mocking McClain's death. At this point, like everybody in Denver and Aurora is like, wow, these cops are actually, they have absolutely no respect for the people here. This is an actual military occupation. They do actually hate us. and. They're patrolling our streets with guns still. Who in their right mind, especially someone who's working in law enforcement, will even make fun of another person, any person being murdered, especially a case as sensitive as Elijah McClain's? Back in the day, you know, they used to lynch black people um, and take pictures, you know, as souvenirs and postcards and give these out as trinkets and as reminders of all the fun that they had watching a black body die. That's what those people did. Eight months prior, those photos were taken and circulated within the department for laughs and nothing had become of it for eight months until somebody decided to leak it. And the disrespect to be making fun of the chokehold, which contributed to Elijah's death right in front of where he had lived. It was so disgusting and outrageous. The only officers who had lost their jobs were the cops who took those photos, and yet the killers were still on the job. The killers still roamed, you know, patrolled our streets. Three officers have been fired, a fourth resigned. Protest leaders say they plan to surround the police station until the department fires the two remaining officers involved in McLean's death. 10 months and nine days. We have gotten more justice over these stupid ass pictures than we have the actual murder of Elijah McClain. That shit is ridiculous. That is the system that we're fighting. That is the mentality that we are standing against today. There were several hundred people that day and people were ready to say time's up. We want these officers 
inspired. This is, this is a people's demand. This is not just PSL's demand. This is not just the demands of activists. This is not just the demands of Elijah McClain's family. This is the Aurora community themselves coming out and saying, time's up. We will not stop until all of Elijah's murderers are behind bars, but tonight they must first fire Nathan Woodyard, Randy Rodima, and anyone who knew of this picture for eight months. With that said, I want to re-emphasize militant, but disciplined. We just got word that Chief Wilson has requested a call with me. I don't know. Yeah. We're being charged with kidnapping for a protest that was around a police station. It was a peaceful demonstration that was an expression of truly righteous outrage at the, the total impunity of the police here. We have a right to protest at a police station, and that's what we did. We did what was our constitutional right to do. If you think about the labor movement, you think about all the struggles that, you know, have been engaged in over the last century and are commonly engaged in when people want to send a message, think about a picket line. And a picket line is always outside of a building, People are marching back and forth. Sometimes they're chanting. That is a classic labor protest and crucial to labor struggles in the United States. That same type of protest could be charged the same way that this was with decades in prison. We were enjoying our music, voicing our concerns, and Elijah was dancing on his way home. And the fact that they're trying to demonize it, just like they demonized him, it just goes to show how they view black people and it goes to show how they disregard their lives. Yeah, this seems to be a very coordinated protest here, a very peaceful protest right now. And it sounds like these folks here, the crowd here, is not going anywhere anytime soon. And on the west side of the District 1 building, which is just north of the new Veterans Hospital here in Aurora, we can see officers on top of the District 1 building. This entire building is surrounded by uh, participants and protesters here. The only people that were being violent were the snipers on the roof. And like the police that were trying to intimidate us into leaving. Chief Wilson is pushing this narrative about this big fear of violence. And I just think that I, I've heard from everybody here that how absurd that is when what we are here to do is simply win a, a portion of the justice that is necessary for Elijah McLean. Our message was, you want us to leave, that's, that's easy. Fire the officers who we saw kill Elijah McLean and we'll leave for tonight. I mean, we're not done, but um, instead of doing that, they sent in tanks, they sent in teams of SWAT cops and you know they brought in uh, chemical weapons and live ammunition to put us down rather than to fire literal murderers who are caught on tape murdering an innocent person in our community um, and now we're the ones facing charges.
everything about the arrest, from the manner of the arrest, from the terrifying raid on Joel, from the multi-car uh, sweep arrests of other activists, to the way that they were held and the length of time that they were held. This was completely unnecessary. These are peaceful political activists. To hold them in jail for that long in COVID-ridden jails was clearly a part and parcel of what is a very vicious, ugly political attack intended to punish people because they were protesting the police and the prosecutors. I'm facing kidnapping charges. I'm facing incitement to riot charges. I'm facing riot charges themselves. Engaging in a riot, inciting a riot, and conspiracy to commit a riot two counts of theft from a person, and two counts of conspiracy to commit theft from a person. I'm facing um, like several felony charges and then you know a few misdemeanors as well. 25 charges, 12 of them felonies. They're now being threatened with up to 48 years in prison. Now, that is among the highest charges that we have ever seen for peaceful political protest in recent years. The only people that are charged because of Elijah McClain's homicide are us. That's how ridiculous this is. We're charged. None of these officers. There has been absolutely no accountability for the officers and medics who murdered Elijah McClain. We have to defend these activists in Denver because what's happening to them could happen to anyone in the United States. And the corruption level between the chief of police, the police, the prosecutors, we can't let them get away with this. We have to come together and make it clear that if they think this is a bellwether or a testing ground to see how far they can go, we're gonna make sure that they can't succeed. One of the reasons why we were targeted was because we were successful in, in bringing out people and organizing people for these actions that were taking place over the summer. That's what made us a threat. And we all know that the Aurora Police Department is a predator, and a predator is most dangerous when it's backed into a corner. And that's exactly what happened this summer. They saw people throughout Aurora and Denver and other parts of Colorado coming to this epicenter of struggle in Aurora, um, the struggle for justice for Elijah McClain, and they said, no, we absolutely cannot have this. This is obviously meant to intimidate us, but we aren't gonna let this sort of oppression stop us. Obviously, it's so important that we, that we keep going and we're going to keep demanding justice uh, no matter what. If we don't lead protests with real power, if we don't show that we're able to shut things down, that we're able to say enough is enough, we won't see any change. We refuse to live in this order anymore. Like that's basically what it comes down to is that question, that, that fundamental instinct of, we actually don't have to live like this and we refuse to live like this.